Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over chapter 10 of the American pageant titled Launching the New Ship of State from 1789 to 1800. You guys already know this, but we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American pageant. Don't worry about it if you have a different edition or a completely different textbook, because at the end of the day, the content's just the same. It's literally just the chapters that move around a little bit. So here are the key concepts for this chapter. These are located at the beginning of every chapter in the American pageant. Um, again, I say this every time, but you should definitely try and match the key terms with each bullet point after you read the chapter because it really does help you organize the information and it will really help you connect information across time periods, which is really what the AP exam is testing. So definitely keep that in mind. So to start off, let's talk about George Washington's administration. The country has just been formed and Washington is placed as president. He is the first president who is uh, the only one to be elected unanimously, meaning everyone agreed that he should be president. Being the commander in chief of the Continental Army, he proved that he was a good leader and that he could lead the American people even in the face of a seemingly impossible task. And he really sets many precedents during his time in office. For example, he established a cabinet of members. So you have the Secretary of the Treasury, who's Alexander Hamilton, you have the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, and you have the Secretary of War, Henry Knox. He's not really that important right now, but just for your information. And keep in mind that in order for the Constitution to be ratified in the first place, it had to have the Bill of Rights added to it. We talked about this in the last chapter. And the Bill of Rights was added because it outlined a specific set of personal liberties that had to be upheld at all costs that were inalienable rights given to every citizen. And this is really key in gaining the support of the Anti-Federalists who initially had opposed the Constitution on the sole basis that they were fearful that it would give the federal government too much power. Remember, uh, when they were under British control as colonies, they had felt the hand of an oppressive, or what they deemed oppressive, uh, monarchy, and they didn't want that to become replicated in the colonies. So they did everything to try and limit a central power. And they were able to strike, for the first time, a real balance between complete authority and, and complete control of the government by the people, only by the people. And that balance is going to be super significant. And here are the 10 amendments, just so that you know. Um, these should be pretty familiar to you for the most part. They're not going to be specifically tested on the exam, but um, you know, just so you know, maybe if it's on a homework assignment or whatever, and you have to fill out what the 10 amendments are. And you should also note that there's a special clause also added into the Constitution, which is called the Elastic Clause. And essentially what it did was it would stretch the power of the legislative branch over issues that weren't already specified in the Constitution. So this is giving a little bit more power to the government because they can bend the law in a way that helps them achieve their goals um, without, of course, restricting personal liberties. You should also know about the Supremacy Clause, which said that when federal and state laws are conflicting, the federal law will always overpower the state law. Um, so just keep that in mind. You should also know about the Judiciary Act of 1789. And essentially what this did was it created the Supreme Court, um, which had a Chief Justice and five Associate Judges. And it also created circuit courts and attorney generals. So you're really establishing a sound legal system that is really able to try and evaluate the law in various different ways. Um, it's not just, you know, this is what this person says, so that's law. The Supreme Court is, although very powerful, giving a place for various voices. And really your takeaway from all of this should be that with these actions, there is a compromise between upholding personal liberties while ensuring that the federal government is capable of controlling the people and that there's not a mobocracy that overpowers authority. By rebelling against Britain, the colonies have set this sort of principle or ideal that in order to get their way, they need to revolt. That's why Shays' Rebellion happened. That's why so many rebellions happened because that's what they saw was the only option to getting any change. And the elite especially are very fearful that this will create a mobocracy, meaning everyone will just riot in order to get something and it will just be chaotic and there won't really be any order when everyone has their own issues because then everyone will just revolt. So this is really ensuring that people will have a 
set process to go through before it escalates into just complete rioting. And during Washington's administration, um, Alexander Hamilton, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, comes up with a lot of financial plans. And this is important because as a Federalist, he wants to create financial policies that benefit the wealthy, who would in exchange replenish the government with monetary and political support. And in this way, power would be concentrated to the top, to the top 1%, and he believed that prosperity would trickle down to the poorer classes. Um, this is a sentiment that will continue to be relevant for decades, but this effect essentially is called the trickle down effect, that if you have all the money concentrated at the top, it will trickle down to the poorer classes. So definitely know about that. However, Hamilton's plans aren't solely for this. Really, it's for getting rid of the national debt that had resulted from the war, and they also want to stimulate trade both domestically and abroad. Um, they're a new nation. They don't really have anything to go off of now that they're not being supported by Britain, and trade is going to be a significant source of income for the country, and they want to make sure that they really take advantage of that. Um, but aside from that, first step is to get rid of the debt. And this is where the plan called funding at par comes into play. And essentially what happened was Hamilton asked Congress to take on the war debt that had been incurred by the states and pay them off at face value. And this is really in an attempt to show other countries that the US, although they are an infant country, they don't really have any experience, is capable of managing their own affairs and that they can be trusted so that there's more opportunities for trade. You also have a plan called Assumption, where all state debts would be paid off by the federal government. And really, he hoped to also unite the nation and make wealthy creditors reliant on the federal government instead of individual states. Again, hoping to gain the trust of the wealthy, either by sheer force or by will, in this case, by sort of sheer force, so that they would help the government and really help them prosper. And Assumption is very controversial because a lot of states had already paid off their debt, um, particularly the southern states, and they thought it was unfair because why would they have to pay off their debts if they knew that it was just going to be taken up by the government anyways? The North isn't doing any work and they're essentially just getting away with it scot-free. So to appease them, DC is moved closer to the South. And again, you see more trading opportunities and in general, a better reputation for the South as, as a result of this. You should also note that Hamilton believed that the more people there are uh, in debt, the more people would want Hamilton's plans to succeed. And essentially, this would also foster some sort of national unity, again, through sheer force, if it's not through individual will. And these plans were financed by tariffs, which also served to protect domestic industries from foreign competition. And this is where you get the whiskey excise tax. So essentially, if you're transporting or trying to sell uh, whiskey, trying to move whiskey in any way, you would be you would have to pay a certain tax just for carrying it. And this really upset farmers, which leads to the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. Uh, essentially what happens is these backcountry farmers in western Pennsylvania resent the tax because in order to transport grain, they have to convert it into whiskey. And although it's a relatively small rebellion, Washington crushes it with unnecessary brutality. And it's really a show of the government's immense power. Again, compare this to Shays' Rebellion. Remember, the state militia of Massachusetts could barely control them. And this is what really started a debate for a better centralized government. And you're seeing this in action with the Whiskey Rebellion. The government is really putting their foot down. They're really making it clear that they will not be played with. And again, that they're not going to let mobocracy rule the nation. Aside from this, there are a lot of debates as to what the Constitution says and, in general, how the Constitution is interpreted. And this is really seen when Hamilton wants to create a national bank that would print paper money in order to stabilize the national currency. And Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson says that the Constitution doesn't give the government the power to create a national bank. And this is really an example of strict construction, which Thomas Jefferson is a huge fan of, especially as an anti-federalist. And this is essentially where you interpret the Constitution word for word. If it doesn't say, if it isn't explicitly outlined, then you can't do it. That's essentially what Jefferson believed. 
And he believed this because the Constitution said that only individual states had the right to create banks, not Congress. Hamilton counters that with the elastic clause, remember stretching the power of the legislative branch, uh, it gives him the power to create a national bank and that the government could take any means necessary to carry out its vested powers. In this case, it was collecting taxes and regulating trade. And this is an example of loose construction. In other words, interpreting the constitution in broad or vague terms, and it was really just based on the general sentiment. So Hamilton argues that the general sentiment of the constitution is to give the federal government more power in carrying out its duties. And as a country, it needs to be able to collect taxes. So any means of doing that is valid. Of course, as long as it doesn't infringe upon personal liberties, which in this case, it doesn't. And at the end of the day, Hamilton wins. He gets the Bank of the United States, which I'll most of the time referred to as uh, BUS. It's not bus, BUS. Um, and it's established and Northern manufacturers really like it because it really helps them finance their own trade. But the Southern Agricultural Society hates it. They really start to view the bank as sort of this evil figure. They don't trust the bank, and we're going to see this sort of lingering sentiment, especially in the Jacksonian era, but that is way in the future. And keep in mind that Hamilton's financial policies had largely encroached on states' rights, and this led to the creation of political parties, specifically Hamiltonian or Federalist or whatever, and Jeffersonian Republican. This party in particular has a bunch of names. There's Democratic Republican, uh, Jeffersonian, Jeffersonian Republican, a lot of names, but essentially they all mean the same thing. So just a heads up. And the Hamiltonian party is really comprised of Federalists. They were often wealthy and they support the vision of a manufacturing industrial society with a strong central government. And you'll really see this come to fruition in the North, especially the North will really be the key powerhouse in terms of industrial power. The Jeffersonians or the Jeffersonian Republicans or the Democratic Republicans um, are really anti-federalists and they're often poor backcountry farmers who support the vision of an agrarian society and they're very much states' rights. They believe everyone should do what they want to do and although they're collectively held by some authority, that shouldn't be so prevalent in their daily lives. And really you can see that this sort of divergence of thought um, is really becoming permanent. Initially, it was just talk, it was just debating, but the formation of political parties is so tremendously significant because it's going to validate the differing beliefs that people have um, regarding the constitution, regarding certain rights and beliefs and all of that. And you're going to see that it's no longer viewed as being unloyal to the country as it was initially. It's more like understanding and debating differences. So super, super important to note. Um, aside from that, let's talk about George Washington's foreign policy. And so to provide a little background to what I'm about to say, you should note that the American Revolution led to the French Revolution because, you know, to help Americans in their war against Britain, France went into debt and they taxed the colonists, which eventually led to a revolution. So now America is in a tough situation. Do they help? Do they not? And during the French Revolution, France asked for aid from the US. Jeffersonians wanted to help because it reminded them of their own fight for freedom, but Federalists were hesitant to intervene because they didn't want to endure the violence and possible war. They were still a new nation, they weren't really on their feet yet, and they didn't want to get into messy business so quickly. And you'll see that, especially with the reign of terror, when French rebels start beheading officials and really pulling out the guillotine, the Federalists are vehemently against supporting the French. So again, decisive debate between the two political parties is intensifying during this time. And really the Jeffersonians, they want to support the French, but they can't really do anything. And again, the Hamiltonians are freaked out. <laughs> um, and during this time, George Washington decides to do essentially nothing with the Neutrality Proclamation of 1793. And essentially this declared that the US would remain neutral regarding the French Revolution and warned American citizens to maintain this sentiment. However, they do supply 
the French with some basic things. But this proclamation essentially set a precedent for American isolationism in foreign policy for decades and decades. And really, this is going to start to change in the mid to late 1800s. So just keep that in mind. And you see that this neutrality is tested with Edmund Genet, and he is a French diplomat who comes to America asking citizens to support the French cause. Washington finds out about this and sends him back to France, and it really shows how American neutrality is being tested, but Washington wants to remain resolute on this. He is going to do what is best for the nation at the given moment. And aside from the French, the U.S. had other problems with other countries. For example, tensions were increasing with Britain when they refused to leave a part of the U.S. that they had agreed to evacuate in a 1783 peace treaty. They took advantage of the profitable fur trade and supplied frontier Indians with munitions to fight the colonists. So this is really a critical issue because it can prevent westward expansion, which again, as we're going to see, is going to become very important to the American lifestyle in the coming decades. And the U.S. attempts to solve this with Jay's Treaty in 1794. Washington sends Chief Justice John Jay of the Supreme Court to London, and the British agree to leave the posts and to repay their damages that they made during the seizure of American ships. They would, you know, try to steal, I guess, American ships overseas, but they didn't say anything about avoiding future seizure or stopping the supply of weapons to the natives and this treaty is so unpopular everyone is so underwhelmed because again all that really happened was jay got what was supposed to happen years ago like a decade ago in a treaty and the britain are just now being okay with it so everyone is super underwhelmed everyone just does not like this treaty another treaty you should know about aside from this is pinckney's treaty pinckney's Pinckney's Treaty in 1795, and this is after Jay's Treaty, and the Spanish really want to make sure that there isn't a strong Anglo-American alliance. So they give anything the U.S. wants, like complete freedom over the Mississippi River and a long disputed territory in Florida. But aside from foreign issues, you do have many domestic issues. For example, um, Chief Little Turtle of the Miami Confederacy, the Native Confederacy that is, often fought settlers because they didn't want the colonists to be on their land. They were encroaching upon their land unfairly. And the U.S. sends in armies to stop them, but it really doesn't work until General Wayne is sent in. And this leads to the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, where the British refuse to protect the Indians, um, which leads to their ultimate defeat, and they have to surrender. And they eventually signed the Treaty of Greenville with the U.S., giving up most of their land in exchange for hunting rights. So this is really significant because it's the first treaty between the U.S. and a native tribe. Aside from this, you should also note that George Washington, he leaves office and in his farewell address in 1796, he advised against permanent alliances with foreign nations and the formation of political parties. This is going to be something that the U.S. follows to some extent, but certain things are inevitable, like the alliances, for example, are going to be inevitable in certain situations. Um, but the U.S. in general will try to uphold this at the very least. And just as a little side note, Washington was fine with temporary alliances in the case of an emergency, um, which is why the U.S. goes ahead with it. I mean, that's basically what happened during the American Revolution, right? The U.S. had a treaty with the French, but he didn't want to make permanent alliances because it could entangle the U.S. in unnecessary conflict. And this is really, again, rooted with the idea of the French Revolution. Had the U.S. gotten into this permanent alliance with France uh, during the American Revolution, they would have had to help them during the French Revolution. And we don't know how that would have turned out. So this is especially the driving factor to why he says this. And you should note that after George Washington leaves office, Alexander Hamilton doesn't actually become president because his financial plans were very unpopular among anti-federalists. So George Washington's vice president, John Adams, is elected instead. Okay, so finally, let's talk about John Adams' administration. Uh, you should note that the French were really upset with Jay's treaty because the U.S. had been making treaties with a common enemy, the British, and it was a violation of the Franco-American Treaty of 1778. This isn't really irrelevant. I didn't even mention it in previous chapters. That's how irrelevant it is. 
but they're bringing it up because the U.S. is not abiding by this treaty they made so, so long ago. And again, you're seeing how Washington's fear that foreign entanglements could come with these permanent alliances is really coming out to play, which is further going to inspire American isolationism in the decades to come. And so to resolve this, Adams sends diplomats to France to resolve any issues peacefully. And this leads to the XYZ affair, where three anonymous spokespeople for uh, Minister Talleyrand of France, who we'll call in this case XYZ, demanded a loan to even talk to Minister Talleyrand. And the Americans are outraged, which causes negotiations to abruptly stop. They didn't want to you know, give money just to be able to talk. They felt like that was really pretentious because it was, and they are absolutely outraged by the French. But eventually the French come around and they agree to actually hear negotiations if the US sends another minister. And Adams does because he knows that otherwise would start a war that would cripple the US before they even really got a chance to shine through. And this leads to the Compromise of 1800, which ultimately ends the Franco-American Treaty. So the US is no longer held to that anymore. And during his administration, a key concept that you should know about is the Alien and Sedition Act in 1798. And these were aimed at reducing the number of immigrants, or aliens as some put them, who tended to support the Jeffersonian party. And this took longer for them to become citizens and allowed the president to deport any immigrants who they considered, quote, dangerous. The Sedition Act said that anyone who criticized the government would be fined, and this is a direct violation of the First Amendment. So people are outraged by this, which leads to the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, um, specifically with the Jeffersons, who were fearful that these acts would be one step in completely abolishing personal liberties guaranteed by the Constitution. They believe that this was just a small baby step towards something bigger, setting a precedent that would allow for this to happen continuously without any backlash. And uh, these resolutions really aim to show that this is unacceptable. And your key takeaway from the resolutions, which James Madison and Thomas Jefferson secretly wrote, should be that they established the compact theory, which stated that there was an agreement between the states and the federal government. And if it was broken, certain remedies for it were acceptable. And you'll see that this becomes an excuse for the South when it secedes during the Civil War. But um, essentially, it's saying that since the government had overstepped its constitutional powers with the acts, the states were allowed to nullify it. And again, this will come up later, even before the South and the Civil War. So that'll do it for this video. Here are the credits for how we got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions and please, please, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps us out and lets us know that this video was helpful for you so that we can make videos in the future.